And before I start, uh, just want to give a public thank you to Chaplain Girardin for the time, effort, and energy he put into the marriage seminar last week. Amen. I uh, haven't heard a lot, but what I've heard was very good. It was well received. It was a blessing. So thank you. Appreciate that. Secondly, am I the only one here that's feeling hot? Can we cut the temp down? Okay, great. I'll be fine. See, if it's not hot, then you shouldn't fall asleep. <laughs> if you fall asleep, then it's my fault, right? So I'll take the risk, and we'll cut the heat down, and hopefully you'll stay awake. But you always stay awake, don't you? Amen. Okay, my message is trusting a traitor. Now, a traitor is one who betrays a person, a cause, or any trust, one who betrays his country by violating his allegiance, one who's guilty of treason. And treason is a violation of a subject of his allegiance to his sovereign or to the state. You can find those definitions in your standard dictionary. Traitor, one who betrays a person, a cause, or a trust, who betrays his country by violating his allegiance. And treason is a violation by a subject of his allegiance to his sovereign or to the state. Traitor and treason, uh, those are powerful words. They can provoke some strong emotions of anger and resentment. We might ask, how in the world could anybody do such a thing? Well, how about an example of a traitor? I will go back in history to your Revolutionary War. And in your schooling, you probably learned about Benedict Arnold. You did? Now, Benedict Arnold was an American. He was a general. And his sentiments switched. And ultimately, he switched sides and went over to the British. But in 1780, he was given command of West Point. He was given command of West Point. And he conspired with the enemy to surrender the fort. And when the scheme was found out, he had to flee. And you know, ever after a betrayal, a traitor's name is held in disrepute. Now, maybe the framers of the U.S. Constitution, to a degree, maybe they had Benedict Arnold in mind when a few years later they penned these words and put them on paper. Article 3, Section 3 of the Constitution says, Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Enemies, giving your enemies aid and comfort. Oh, I feel a distraction coming on. It was last time I was here, I talked to you about lies, conspiracies, and distractions. Was that just the last time I was here? I feel a distraction coming on for a moment. I will try to control myself. Treason against the United States shall consist only in levying war against them or in adhering to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort. Oh, maybe you mean like trading five Taliban leaders for one soldier whose own platoon mates said he was disaffected and walked away? I digress, pardon me. I will try to control myself. Is that giving aid and comfort to your enemy? Yeah. Giving five leaders back? But you know, traitors are typically held in disrepute after their betrayal. 
And at some point in time, all the betrayals of all time, of all countries, will be laid out. God will tell the true story of this world, will he not? He will tell the true story of this world. Think with me of what you've read in John 13. You've read it before, we won't turn there. But in John 13, Christ applied Psalm 41.9 to the one who would betray him. And we know the one who would betray him was Judas Iscariot. Now what infamy has surrounded that name ever since? I've never known anybody named Judas, have you? I've never, I've never known. Maybe none of you have. You think, who would name their child Judas after this act in the scripture? Judas Iscariot, the traitor. I imagine in your time you've heard about a Judas goat. You've heard about Judas goat? Judas goat is a specially trained goat that is used in animal herding. The Judas goat will lead sheep to slaughter or it will lead sheep or cattle up into a truck so they are taken away to slaughter, but the goat itself is spared to betray another day. And I wonder if the other animals knew of the intentions of their traitorous leader if they would have followed so happily into that truck and off they go on their last ride. Huh. Judas Iscariot, Judas Goat, same thing, traitor. Would you like your name associated with an animal that was used for that purpose? A Richard Goat. I don't like that. I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew 10. Judas proved to be a traitor, but prior to being that traitor, he was in the master's inner circle. He was allowed to be there. He was trusted to be there. He had an honor and a privilege that only 12 had. Ultimately, they were the first 12 apostles, as we call them. And he was entrusted with the power and blessing of God Almighty. At least I believe he was. Matthew 10, starting at 1, it says, And when he called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. So it says there that Judas Iscariot also betrayed him, but it says he called the twelve and he gave them authority to cast out unclean spirits and do certain things in his name. Heal sicknesses. It does not say all of them except Judas were given this power. So the twelve were given this power, which I conclude and assume included Judas, was entrusted with the very power, this delegated authority through Christ, authority and power to cast out demons and heal sicknesses. In verses 7 and 8, this is what they were told. As you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think about it, it seems incredible that Judas, who became the traitor, was entrusted with the power of God Almighty and was included in this commission to do these things. Preach the gospel, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, those who are spiritually dead, and perhaps those who were physically dead also. Cast out demons, freely you've received, freely give. Judas was included, and he became a traitor. And we might ask, how in the world could he do that, become a traitor, when he was so close to Christ? Live with him. Work with him. Saw everything that he did. Listen to all his teachings. Well, you know, it's called a free will choice. Free will choice. He retained his free will just as we do, correct? He always has his free will. We might also say it's a mystery. 
It's something akin to the mystery of iniquity where Lucifer in heaven decided to rebel against the Almighty God, the Creator. How could he do that? In the very pure environment of heaven, he's going to do that? Well, it's called a mystery. Judas was in close connection with Christ, yet he turned out to be a traitor. He was entrusted with the very power of Almighty God, included in the inner circle, traitor, in the end. Let's look at uh, John 12. These are familiar words to you. John 12. Starting at verse 1, it says, Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used it, he used to take what was put into it. So, Judas was in the inner circle, he's included in the commission, he's granted the delegated power of the Almighty to heal diseases, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, and so forth. He proved to be a traitor, and he was also a thief. That says something about his character, doesn't it? Judas, thief. Judas, traitor. Judas, the thief. And Judas, the traitor. Judas, the one who had eternity in his grasp, sold out cheap. 30 pieces of silver he sold his master. Judas, the one who had regrets, but without repentance. He returned the money, but failed to return to God. In John 13, you could read when Jesus told him, what you do, do quickly. It says there that Satan entered him and he went out and it was night. Night Physically, night, spiritually, he's in the darkness. He ends up betraying Jesus with a kiss. How do you like that? A kiss, the sign of affection. Maybe the others, uh, maybe nobody or not many people knew Jesus by sight, or in the dark they wanted to make no mistake, or whatever the deal was, he betrayed him with a kiss. Betrayed him with a kiss. He dies with no hope at his own hand. Light is out. Now, if you and I had any inkling, any idea, any insight that somebody we knew, if they were in our inner circle, and if we had a sense that they were going to betray us and steal from us, how long would we let them in the inner circle? Or would we ever let them in to begin with? Would you? What's the old saying? You burn me once, shame on you. You burn me twice, shame on me. And once someone burns you, it's okay to draw some boundaries. You can still relate to them, but they don't have to get in to the inner sanctum of your life or the inner sanctum of your group. You know, you and I can't kid ourselves. I think we would eliminate that potential threat. If we knew somebody was going to betray us, steal from us. But our Savior allowed Judas to be there. He gave him an opportunity, gave him a privilege that he failed to improve upon. And we might ask, what's the matter with him? Have you ever asked what's the matter with him? Before we get too self-absorbed or self-righteous, Let's ask, what's the matter with us? What's the matter with me? You and I enter this world as a traitor against God. 
You and I enter this world with a fallen human nature. You and I go toward the evil like water goes downhill. But when and as we make profession of faith in Christ, and we come to him, we are to be granted the divine nature within. We're supposed to be born again, where we can make different choices and have a different kind of life. But because you and I always retain our free will, there's always a possibility that you and I can revert back to the status of being a traitor. Is that true? It's true. And I have to ask myself, maybe you have to ask yourself, am I like that guy who the goat's named after, whose name we might not want to say, have I ever been like him? Hopefully, I haven't. If I have, I can repent. Judas had regrets, apparently not enough repentance to believe he could be forgiven. He went and hung himself. He died. But you know, every day, our Savior trusts us to be in his inner circle. He trusts us to be in his inner circle. And he entrusts us with both physical, material blessings and goods, and spiritual riches, doesn't he? The question comes, will we honor the privilege? Will we improve upon the privilege? Or will we be like, fill in the blank, fill in the blank, a traitor and a thief? We don't want to be like that, do we? We don't want to be like that. In our quiet moments, maybe there's times when we think we have been like that. I can't talk for you. I can only talk for me. And when I feel that way, that I've been like that, there's still a loving Father that I can approach through Christ, His Son, His only begotten Son. What a uh, sledgehammer of a question. Am I? I don't talk for me. In any way, am I like Judas, a thief and a traitor? What a question. What labels we have to avoid. Thief, traitor. Judas, thief, traitor. Judas, goat. Thief and traitor and hypocrite. He didn't care about the poor, did he? Sell that oil, put the money in the box, you know, and all kind of fudge things around and all help myself and maybe he lied and said he spent on certain purposes and didn't, he spent it on himself. Thief, traitor, hypocrite. Good grief. Good grief. Listen to a question scripture asks. Will a man rob God? Hmm but you have robbed me. But you say, how did we rob you? In what way did we rob you? I don't know that I robbed you. I don't think I robbed you. He says, in tithes and offerings. Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. Prove me. Test me. See if I don't open you the windows of heaven. Pour out blessings. Blessings overflowing that there won't be room enough to receive. So God asks us to return one-tenth of our increase to show that we understand it's all his to begin with. You and I can be faithful, or you and I, I'll put this way, when we're convicted about this, we can be faithful, or we can be unfaithful. There may be a process wherein we have to be convicted. Like understanding God is the creator and he owns everything. God created us. He owns us by creation. God through his son redeemed us, so he he owns us by redemption. He doubly owns us. So if he owns us, that which comes to us is his, his blessing. We return a tenth to acknowledge it's all his to begin with. In our class in the office, we went through Deuteronomy 8. And it talks in there to the Israelites. It says, when you come into the land that you've been promised 
and your flocks and your herds multiply, your grain multiplies, your barns are filled, and everything is going fine, don't forget that it was God who brought you here. Don't think that it was your capacities and abilities that acquired all this stuff. In fact, in there it says, it's the power of God that gives, it is the blessing of God, or it's God who gives you the power to make wealth. God gives you the power. God gives you the capacity, mentally, physically, whatever it is, to earn a living, to make wealth. And he says, when, when you come into that place, if you ever come into a place where the road's real wide for you, don't forget who brought you here. Don't forget. I quoted a song in the, in the class. Maybe you've heard it. It's, remind me, dear Lord. Some of the words, pull back the curtain of memory now and then. Show me where you've brought me from and where I could have been. I'm only human and tend to forget. So remind me, remind me, dear Lord. Remind me where I was. Remind me that, but for the grace of God, I could be wherever. And you can say the same, but for the grace of God, there go I, when you see somebody else in trouble in their life. So God has entrusted us with physical wealth, material wealth, blessings. We can be faithful or unfaithful. I'll leave that with you to thresh that out between you and the Almighty. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12. God has also entrusted us with spiritual blessings, spiritual gifts. Paul writes about these in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4, but we're only going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 from verse 14, verse 4 rather. It says, there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretations of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So the Holy Spirit divides the gifts among the members, and they are given for the common good of all. And we are entrusted with these gifts. Some call them talents, spiritual talents, spiritual gifts, and we are to be used by God to win others to him. But let us go to the end of this chapter, chapter 12. You've read these before. There's a series of questions in verse 29 and 30, and the, I believe, and the implied answer is no to all these questions. Are all apostles? Mm -mm. Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? The answer is no. The Holy Spirit divides the gifts as he wills. But some may tell you that you have to have, to have certain miraculous gifts to be a first-class Christian. And it makes God speak out of both sides of his mouth. The God who willed to save me by sending his son to die on the cross then turns around and wills to damn me because he doesn't, he doesn't give me a particular gift? Does that make sense? Make no sense. Doesn't make any sense. But God does give gifts to those who are his. If you want to mark these passages down, you can read them later. It's Matthew 25, 14 through 30. Luke 19, 11 through 27. It's Matthew 25, 14 to 30. And Luke 19, 11 to 27. It's the story of the gifts of the talents. There's a master who's leaving, 
And the story goes, he gives one servant five talents, one I think is three, and one he gives one. And he tells them to occupy themselves and do business till he returns. And when he comes back, there's an accounting. And the one who says, you gave me five talents, I've gained five more. He says, great, you're over 10 cities. Another one, you gave me three, I got three more. Well, that's great. Here's your reward. The other one who was given one said, you know what? Uh, I know you're, you're a tough guy. Uh, you uh, you kind of reap where you don't sow. You drive a hard bargain. You're a tough businessman. I was afraid to lose this, so I hit it. Here's what's yours. And did he get, was he pleased? No, he was mad. I feel a distraction. I'll try to forbear. He was upset. <laughs> he said, take what he has and give it to the one that has 10. Right? Take it away. I was afraid. I hid it. You know, the minimum given was one. So we typically say that everybody in the church has at least one spiritual gift. Don't we say that? We say that. Everybody has at least one gift, and it's given by the Holy Spirit to profit the whole body. And what do you and I get from this story? You don't use it, you lose it. Here. There is an expectation that we improve upon the gifts that have been bestowed upon us. There is an accounting for the use of the gifts that have been bestowed upon us. And there is an eternal reward or an eternal loss based upon the use of those gifts that have been bestowed upon us. And I didn't copy that from anybody, in case you're wondering. If you didn't catch it all, you can ask me later. Three points to the story as I see it. You and I are gifted. We can serve. We can be the light of the world. Christ said he was the light of the world, and he says to his people, you are the light of the world. Amen? And he wasn't saying that to, we say, a, a collective group, yes. The lampstands in Revelation represent the churches, but he's also saying it to each individual. You individually are a light to the world, and collectively you're to be a light. Now, in the book of Titus, from chapters 2.11 through 3.14, Titus 2.11 to 3.14, we won't turn there, but there are four verses which speak about the good works which should come through the believers in Christ. And would you consider it a good work to share the light of truth with somebody and to share the gospel message with them and hopefully find the see them find salvation. That's a good work? Yeah, that is a good work. Christ would approve of that. He said, go. He said, go. Baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teach everything that I have commanded you. And the commission is for everybody, isn't it? The commission's for everybody. Go back to Matthew 10. It said, Jesus called the 12 together and gave them an authority to uh, heal sicknesses and cast out devils and so forth, and Judas was included. It does not say that he was excluded. He said he called his 12 and told them to do these things. I would take it he was included, right? But he proved to be a traitor. This commission is for everybody. We call it the Great Commission. Now let me state some things here. I know the Almighty wins the souls. No amen? Yeah. amen? Does that take the pressure off you to a degree? Amen. You're not responsible for the choices other people make with what you share with them. You can't make their choices as much as you might like to sometime. So the Almighty wins the souls. Paul wrote that he planted and Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. 
But you know, we are called to plant and water, aren't we? We're called to plant and water. And I'm making it individually, some way, somehow. But the Almighty wins the souls. And we're also told that our labor is not in vain. Our labor is not in vain. You believe that? Someday, you will see a result of your labor. God's promised that. I'll get back to that in a minute or two. I also know that our conference has some goals that are stated on their website. You can go on the website under what's called Vision 2020. You ought to be able to find this. That by 2020, our membership will more than double in size one precious individual at a time. Silence. How's that going to happen? By 2020, our membership will more than double one precious individual at a time. Now, God is interested in numbers. He doesn't want, how many does he want to perish? None. So he's interested in numbers. He's also interested in the quality and the, the lifestyle, the growth of those who come to him. But remember how it was when you came to him. How many years ago was that? Were you as polished as you might be now? Was I? We were diamonds in the rough that God has polished over the years. Sometimes it takes years to have that sanctification, that continual growth of moral uprightness. So God's interested in numbers and he is interested in the quality and he wants us all to be remade into the image of Christ himself. But people have to start somewhere. But by 2020, the conference wants to see the membership doubled, one precious individual at a time. Now, I'm going to repeat myself. Several times I've mentioned that in the past, the denomination had a yearly theme and one year the theme was one by one, W-O-N by O-N-E, one by one. Remember me saying that? You tired of me saying that? Nobody wants to answer. <laughs> one by one, W-O-N by O-N-E. The conference membership can double by 2020 one by one. Each person says, Lord, use me to find one who will. And as I mentioned, I had a friend that used to pray, God, send me the easy ones. Send me the ones you're already working on. Send me the ones that you've got just ripe for the picking, that they're going to make a decision and seal their decision for the eternal kingdom and for the earthly church, the denomination, by making their way into the baptismal pool. Now, Tom did a marvelous job on the baptismal pool. Amen? Amen. You did. That's, that is beautiful. We need to use it. Yes. We need to use it. Somebody probably has God working on them, bringing them to a point of making a decision, to give their heart and life to Christ, to subscribe to the uh, theological beliefs of this denomination. But remember, your first and foremost is your attachment to Christ. You can know all the teachings, and without Christ, you know all the teachings. Amen. With Christ, you have an experience where you're changed, where those teachings will become a new reality for you. So our labor in Christ, in for Christ is not in vain. The Almighty gives the increase. And perhaps it won't be till eternity that we see the full scope of the blessing of God and the fruit of God that he, that he produced through our life. Now, I imagine you can look back and see there were a number of influences on in your life, different people that kind of brushed against you, bumped against you, you shared a conversation or they shared a book or something and you've done the same with other people and maybe in fact it was in another state 
another town. Maybe, in fact, they're converted now. They're Christians. Maybe even Seventh-day Adventists. You don't even know about it. Maybe you don't. But in eternity, I think we will see, because God says your labor is not in vain, you will see, I believe we'll see, that God used us to influence people. God uses a multiple, multiple influences on the same person, doesn't he? You could probably think of a number of influences in your life. And there in eternity, I think we'll see an accounting of that, the telling of the tale. However, now I had to have a however, right? However, you and I live in the here and now. We live on earth. We dwell on earth. I believe it would be nice if we all saw some fruit of our life or fruit of God's work in our life, not just the fruit of the Spirit, the transformation of character, but God using us to touch somebody else who makes a commitment himself to Christ for the eternal kingdom and also for the earthly church, the visible church on earth, and that that person will make their decision to be in that baptistry giving their heart to Christ. Would that be good for everybody to see that? To say, yeah, God in fact... God wins the souls, the Almighty wins the souls, but he worked through me, me who, I can't, you know, I can't save myself. You can't save yourself. What business do I have to do? But he says, you know, go. Go. I'm opening a way for you. Go. There's somebody in your life that may well be close to making that decision. You need to let God speak to you so he can use you to help the process along. Amen? Amen. Number one priority should be some type of personal evangelism. But maybe one of the last times I was here, I talked about enough's enough. How uh, was it Job and Jeremiah cursed the day of their birth? Sometimes life gets to be overbearing, and we're buried ourselves to the point where we can't even think about reaching out to somebody else. Sometimes it's like that. I know it's like that. But we still have to ask God to use us. Even when we are in Death Valley in the furnace, God can still use you. He can still use you. I do feel a distraction coming on here. Did I talk to you when I talked to you about distractions? I mentioned football. <laughs> Did I mention uh, something about a two-liter pop bottle flying off of a TV screen? Uh, one of my stellar moments. But back in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, Vince Lombardi was the coach of the Green Bay Packers. And it was said of him that he never asked anything, at least I remember this, it was said of him he never asked anything of his players he would not do himself. And hopefully I, I'm not lost myself in that little story. I think I've told you, when I got this call to come here, I was asked to verify every baptism I had been involved with back to year one of my ministry. And I'd never been asked that before. And I had to make some phone calls, and I did have some forms that I had filled out, and I had to get all this together. And you know, a baptism is a miracle, isn't it? Amen. It's not something I create. It's not something you can create. It's a miracle through the power of the Almighty. But I was asked to be accountable. So I got it all together. And I sent in the information. And I've also told you I've been in conferences where at workers' meetings, a sheet of paper, eight and a half by 11, whatever the size is, is given out. It's turned landscape. Pastor's name's down one side, and the, the months of the year across the other side, and there's a grid. And in every little grid box, 
there was a number for the, how many baptisms a pastor had for each month. And believe me, there were lots of goose eggs on the, on the paper, and I had some goose eggs myself during months. Other months, God blessed, there were numbers for people. But those are miracles, aren't they? And I thought sometime I'm being held, it seems like I'm being held accountable and responsible for something I can't accomplish or produce. I can't create a miracle in somebody's life. But you know, I can be part of God's miracle in their life. Amen? And you can be part of God's miracle in somebody's life. No amens? Do you believe that? You can, be, you can be part of God's miracle in somebody's life. You don't create the miracle. But you can be part of it. And God wants to use you to be part of it. So, as you exit, I'm going to give you a few comments. I think you'll read in these comments that you cannot be involved in evangelism by proxy. And you cannot buy your way out of it through a financial contribution. Have mercy, right? You can't buy your way out of it. You can't proxy it out to somebody else. One by one. W-O-N by O-N-E. And you know what? God wants to use each one here to be the one through whom he reaches another precious individual. One at a time. One at a time. And as all the members of a congregation or the conference put themselves at God's disposal, yes, indeed. You can see membership double. Is that too difficult for God? Is it too difficult for your concept of God? No? It's not too difficult. God accepts people where they are. He accepted you where you are. And it took how many years to get you where you are now? God may work with somebody. They may take advanced steps in a short time, more steps than I took or you took over a longer time. We believe we're at the end of time, don't we? God may well work in people's lives and hearts, and they just they see it all, and they commit to it, and they might go leaps and bounds beyond where we even are. But God has gifted us so we can be used in his service. The question comes, will we trade on the spiritual gifts and talents that have been entrusted to us? Will we improve on the spiritual gifts and talents that have been entrusted to us? Will we use the gifts God gives us to glorify God or to glorify self or try to? or try to make it look like we're glorifying God when we're really glorifying self. You know, when I stand up here, or any pastor stands in a pulpit, or anybody stands in a pulpit, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about the Almighty. It's about our Savior. It's about salvation. Will you and I commit ourselves to God to have an experience like Philip had? Remember Philip? Book of Acts, chapter 8. He was told, go join this chariot. I can't, I'm too busy. Get somebody else. No, you, go join this chariot. I got a four-lane highway open for you you don't even know about. So he goes, and he hears the guy reading, Isaiah the prophet. He could have said, well, he's reading Isaiah, he'll get it. Well, he was prompted to ask a question. Do you understand what you read? The guy says, how can I let somebody guide me? Do you, know, you, do, well, you know anything? Come on up here. So it says, from that text, he preached Christ. And then the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized like that, went on his way rejoicing, took the seed of the gospel back to Ethiopia, and said Philip was caught up, right? Amen. He ends up somewhere else. Will you and I commit to having that kind of a relationship where we hear that voice that says, go, go do this or see this person. Yeah, you don't understand. You don't understand. Just go. 
Ananias, go find Saul of Tarsus. You gotta be kidding me. No, <laughs> go find him. Pray for him. He's a chosen instrument. Somebody out there may be like Saul of Tarsus in your life. The most unlikely can respond. And remember, evangelism is not the task of just a pastor or just an evangelist. I've had people in the past say they likened an evangelist, this is not very flattering, but they likened an evangelist to a hard gun. Remember that TV show, Have Gun, Will Travel? Some of you aren't that old. <laughs> I saw the reruns. <laughs> An evangelist, hard gun. Not very flattering, is it? The congregation should be full of evangelists. In your own life, in your own realm, with your own personality and your own gifts, and the opportunities that God gives you, doors he opens, the church is supposed to be full of evangelists and Bible workers. It's not the job of just a few, it's the job of everyone. And remember, God is entrusting us with spiritual gifts. He's trusting us to be engaged. We can be faithful or we can be unfaithful. If we're unfaithful, we're like that guy we don't want to name. God's trusting us. Let's not disappoint him. Amen? Amen. Amen.